enjoy my work and you enjoy my frameworks, I'm running a weekly poker class. They have been extremely well received so far. In the classes, I go heavy into everything poker, in every spot. I talk about exploitative line, how we build dynamic ranges based off of the player that we're up against, where the pool's ranges are weak, where the pool's ranges are strong. We talk about timing tells, how we use our frameworks to break down ranges in every spot where our opponents are vulnerable, how we can manipulate their range through bet sizing and timing, player profile, pre-flop, post-flop, mental game, you name it. If you can just find one or two concepts per class, you will have a meteoric rise in your win rate and your results will certainly benefit. Every class is one and a half hours for 75 US dollars. All the classes have a multiple choice interactive element to them. Whether you attend the live class or you purchase the recordings, you can follow along and track your progress. When you're ready to take your game to the next level, check out the Discord, send me a message. We'd be happy to have you. And I'm sure that after the first class, you'll agree. You'll be happy that you came. Take care, guys. What is up, YouTube? Play it's Mark here, back with another video. The last hand breakdown and highlight video got so much positive feedback and you guys were asking for more. So I decided to make another one for you guys. This one is gonna be themed with how to hero call. First wanna add a disclaimer that hero calling is the single quickest way to lose a lot of money in poker. The vast majority of players under bluff in every spot. This is a poker education channel and the last thing that I want is for you guys to start calling down everything after this video, as you'll just lose a bunch of money and nobody wants that. Having said that, hero calling weak imbalanced ranges is one of the most profitable situations in poker. My last video highlights were all hands played within the last couple months. This video's hands are all played years ago when I was grinding full time. This is when poker was my entire life. I was extremely dialed in and focused, and I spent all of my time breaking down my opponent's ranges and understanding how to counter their strategies. So today we're going to take a look at how and when to hero call, some of the criteria that I would look for in order to make a light call down. A bunch of these hands are high stakes heads up hands. I was a heads up specialist for years before getting into six max. Coming from a heads up background, you learn to really pay attention to your opponent's strategy. It forces you to treat each opponent's game like a puzzle and figure out what lines they are strong in and overfold versus them and what lines they are weak in and be very aggressive in those lines. Some things to look for when considering a light call down are bet sizing tells, timing tells, and range construction imbalance. So a very easy example of a range construction imbalance, let's say that you open the button and the fish three bets you in the big blind and you call, the flop is king deuce deuce and he bets one third, you call with let's say pocket fours and the hand goes to showdown and he shows pocket queens. And then in orbit later, a similar situation happens, he three bets you, you call, the flop is ace four four and he bets pot, you call and it goes to showdown and he ends up having ace king. So this is a very simple example of a sizing split where this player might be choosing 33% with his middling hands and then potting his strong hands. And then another type of a range construction imbalance is going to be something like you play against a player type who, let's say, player three bets you, again, the flop is ace four four, and he always or he very often checks with his ace x, but he bets all of his bluffs and he bets his middling pairs like pocket nines. Things like this are something that happen all the time in all stakes of poker, and there is a huge amount of EV to be won if you can pick up on them. So I thought before we look at the hand montage, we are going to do a deep dive analysis on two hands so you guys can understand roughly what was going through my head and how I decided to call down in these spots. And hopefully you guys can find the balance of not overdoing these concepts, but picking and choosing your spots where they will apply and it will certainly help you make more money at the tables. So in the first hand, we are heads up at 510 against a regular. I open the button, 
2.5x, my opponent three bets, I have a very easy call, nothing of note yet. Flop is 10.94 with a flush draw. And right away, my opponent chooses the half pot sizing. And likely what was happening in this at this time was that I thought that my opponent was choosing a larger sizing with a lot more of his value combinations, specifically the pocket, or I guess specifically the king 10, ace 10, pocket jacks, pocket queens, pocket kings, and pocket aces region. I still think he can be betting the nuts that block the board with this sizing, so he could have a hand like 10-9, pocket nines, and pocket tens, but a lot of the other value combinations are incentivized to bet larger on this board texture. I have a very easy call. Turn, use of diamonds, and my opponent is going to bet. And if you look at his bet size here, he bets an even 215, where on the flop he bet 81 point something, which means that on the turn, he has deliberately sized down his turn bet from his preset buttons. So here, let's say, for example, he wanted to bet, let's say, for example, he was going to bet 75%. That's the type of sizing he wanted to bet in this scenario. But what ended up happening here was he deliberately chose a smaller sizing and what that means is that he's choosing a sizing based off of what his hand is trying to accomplish. And so here in this scenario, what that means is he's going to have a very polarized range where I think that he can have the super nuts to this sizing, and then he's going to have a ton of draws. So super nuts would be he can have pocket tens to this sizing, maybe 10-9 of diamonds. I still don't think he has many just king-10 and ace-10 because that's going to very likely size up the flop, but he could have jack, uh, 10x of diamonds as well. So if he has a hand like jack-10 of diamonds, he could have that. So on the turn, we need to think about his overall range and just how many potential bluffs he has. So firstly, he's going to have all the lower flush and straight draws, which means he's going to have queen jack suited, queen jack off, jack eight suited, jack eight off, queen eight suited. He's going to have hands like six, seven suited, seven, eight suited, five, six of hearts, five, six of diamonds, five, three of hearts, five, three of diamonds, king x suited of both and queen x suited of both flush draws. So hands like queen five of hearts, queen six of diamonds, jack seven of all suits, so many potential bluff candidates that when we start to remove our opponent's value region from previous streets and this street, meaning that he doesn't have the king 10, ace 10, jacks, queens, kings, and aces, then with the plethora of bluffs that my opponent is going to have, I think that we have to call the turn again. So I do. My hand beats all of his bluffs and my hand is going to have equity against when he does have a top pair, I can always hit the queen, the king, the jack. And the other thing to note is that I have a hand that has good implied odds in the sense of when my opponent is bluffing with hands like queen six of diamonds or six five of hearts, all the cards that I make my hand on the river, a queen, a king, or a jack, he's going to pure barrel. So we call. And the river is the offsuit deuce, so everything bricks. And now we run into a scenario, so my opponent is going to jam, and we run into the scenario where it's super easy for my opponent to be massively over bluffing here, particularly when we've identified that it's very likely that he's removed a large portion of the value region. I still think here for value, we're going to run into specifically 
pocket tens he could have, although that might check the river. He could definitely have pocket nines. He could have 10-9 of diamonds. I'm not worried about a lot of the other tens at this point on the river because I already discounted king-10 and ace-10. And I think that jack-10 is unlikely to jam the river and queen-10 also unlikely to jam the river, possible, but we still need to take into consideration just how easy it is for him to have way too many bluffs in this scenario. The other thing to note is that he's obviously never going to bluff ace high. So if he ever had a hand like ace five, he's never going to jam the river. So here I figured that likely to do with his timings and sizings and my understanding of how this player was constructing his range, he was just going to roll up with way too many of all the bluff combos I named. Just name them again real quick so you guys can think about just how many combos there are. So we got 7-8 offsuit, 7-8 suited, jack-8 offsuit, jack-8 suited, queen-jack offsuit, queen-jack suited, 5-6 suited. We have suited jacks like jack-3 of diamonds, jack-5 of diamonds, jack-6 of diamonds, jack-7, all, all four, jack-7 suited, all four combos. Queen-8 suited, he could have king-3 of diamonds, king-5 of hearts, just all of these hands. So very easy for us, very easy for him to, like I said, be overbluffing. And we end up making the call expecting to see too many of the lower high card hands. So we call and we see the queen eight of hearts and we're happy to take down the pot. And that is an example of the thought process that I would have while playing this type of hand. And let's take a look at another one. So in this hand, we are playing four-handed. We are red battling at 5-10. This hand is going to be against King-10 of clubs, who was uh, one of the most winning mid-stakes player of all time on stars. Good, definitely a good player. So as the hand plays out, he's going to limp the small blind. Like I said, this hand was played some years ago, and at the times, I mean, still to this day, some players play a, a limping range in the small blind. Totally fine. I'm going to isolate the king jack offsuit, as I think that my hand is well ahead of his range, and he is going to go for a limp three bet. And so right away, it's important to understand ranges at all times. He's a good player, so this is not just pocket aces. He is going to be playing a limp re-raise strategy with a reasonably balanced range, and his strategy is going to be a bunch of, it's going to be a polarized range is what I'm up against. So he's going to have a bunch of suited connectors, and he's going to have some of his strong over pairs, and it's not going to be hands like ace eight offsuit and things of that nature. It's going to be a, a more polarized range. I have an easy call. Flop is 10 deuce four and I flop the king high club. He goes for a bet. So right away, it's important to understand bet sizing here. The fact that he chooses this sizing means that he's certainly not betting his range. So I likely do not need to worry about him having a hand like ace king of hearts or ace queen of diamonds for this sizing i think that my hand is a very easy call i beat a bunch of his bluffs like seven eight eight nine etc i have the two over cards to a strong top pair and i have backdoor straight draw backdoor flush draw so we have a call turn, jack, and here where things get interesting. He goes for the essentially one-third sizing. And here, if you look at the board texture, we can now make a bunch of assumptions about his range due to the turn sizing. So the first thing that we think of is we understand that there is no way that this is his only turn size in this scenario. Okay, so what are some hand classes that we can remove from him choosing this sizing. So the first one is pocket queens through aces. I don't think he ever has. He would always either jam the turn or bet large, likely just jam the turn. 
Same thing with a bunch of his jacks. Like, if he has a hand here like Ace Jack of Diamonds, he is always just going to be jamming the turn for protection and to get all the money in if I decide to call off with a 10 without a bad river card coming. Okay, and now we think about the fact that he has the polarized range from preflop. What are some of the hands that he is going to roll up with here as a bluff? He's going to have a bunch of hands like 8-9 suited, queen-8 suited, queen-9 suited, 7-8 suited, 5-6 suited, ace-5 suited, etc. And so we certainly want to call to keep in some of the low equity draws, but something to note is a lot of the suited connectors here with a bunch of the additional equity are likely to just jam the turn. Certainly bet bigger, very likely jam, but never choose a side. So specifically the hands I'm talking about are hands like 5-6 of clubs, 5-3 of clubs, 8-9 of clubs, queen-9 of clubs, queen-8 of clubs. All of those pair plus flush draw hands are 100% out of this turn range. He could potentially have the super nuts to this sizing, but my jack is very strong blocking. So like pocket jacks he could have to this sizing, but with me having a jack, it makes it very unlikely. Another hand that he might have for this sizing is another super nut hand like ace jack of clubs would make sense. So we have an easy call. And the river is the worst card in the deck. The ace of clubs. Now all of the flushes beat me. King queen beats me. Five three beats me. And Ace-5, Ace-Queen, and Ace-King beat me. Not good. He's going to go for a jam. And here we need to think about, due to his turn sizing, how, and how many of the value combinations we can actually take out of his range. So because of his turn sizing, he never has 5-3 of clubs. He never has 5-6 of clubs, again, because these hands are going to jam the turn. So 5-3 of clubs, gone. 5-6 of clubs, gone. 8-9 of clubs, gone. Queen-9 of clubs, gone. King-Queen of clubs, he can't have. I have the King of clubs. Queen-9 of clubs, gone. 7-8 of clubs, gone. He can't have any of the King-X of clubs, so he can't have King-9 of clubs. King eight, king seven, king six, because I hold the king. And so the other thing to think about is when he's bluffing with a hand like ace three or ace five, since he can't have the flush because the ace is on board, he's never going to jam the river with those hands. Those hands would always be a check to either check call or check fold. He's never going to jam for value with those weak hand, with those hands on this board, as he would need me to call with worse. So the hands that I'm going to lose here are I'm going to lose to, he's going to have some king-queen, but I block that with the king of clubs. And the fact that he's taken a sizing scheme to heavily reduce his value combinations of the flushes, and he chose a flop sizing, which removes him having pocket tens because he bet large on the flop. So he's never going to have top set on this board betting large on the flop. So we run into a scenario where because my opponent has chose a very specific sizing scheme, he's actually going to end up having too many bluffs, in my opinion. So we end up going for the call down. And we see the 5-6 of spades. And so here I think that my opponent is just going to simply have way too many 5-6 of spades, 8-9 of non-flush draw, queen-9 non-flush draw, king-9 non-flush draw, because again, they're all just going to jam the turn when they have the flush draw. So just another hand example of how we break down the ranges using all the information that we have, really paying attention to bet sizing and board dynamics to assign our opponent a range, and it enables us to win more pots the better job we do. Before we begin in the hand compilation, I want to warn you in advance that things are going to get pretty crazy. 
The crazier and lighter call down I make simply means the more confident and accurate I felt my read of the situation and my opponent's range was. None of these hands should be taken in a vacuum. All of these hands means that I had history and a mental database of what I thought my opponent was doing, and I'm actively attacking their ranges based off of data points that I have been compiling. Every play was done with at least what I thought were strong reads. This is my exploitative poker framework in its rawest form. It's me willing to shift my ranges drastically, looking for max exploit lines for max EV. High risk, high reward. Enjoy, guys. Warning. The following video may contain poker hands that are harmful or traumatizing to a poker mind that is incapable of stepping out of solver land and into max exploit territory. Viewer discretion is advised. Thank you. 